And uh, one of the things that we noted from our evaluation uh, was that Mr. Brooks on the night of this incident was calm, he was cordial, and really displayed a cooperative nature. Uh, secondly, even though Mr. Brooks was a prepared, his demeanor during this incident uh, was almost jovial. Um, also, we noted that uh, he received many instructions from the Atlanta officers, and he was asked many questions. Some of the questions he, he was asked repeatedly, but for 41 minutes and 17 seconds, he followed every instruction, he answered the questions. Um, the fourth thing we noted is that Mr. Brooks was never informed that he was under arrest for driving under the influence. And uh, this is a requirement of the Atlanta Police Department when one is charged with the DUI, uh, the Atlanta Police Department's own procedures require that that person is in, informed immediately that they are under arrest. And then he was grabbed from the rear uh, by uh, Officer Roth, who made an attempt to physically restrain him after the 41 minute and 17 second discussion. We concluded and considered it as uh, one of our important considerations that Mr. Brooks never presented himself as a threat. Um, at the very beginning, he was peacefully sleeping in his car. After he was awakened by the officer, he was cooperative and he was directed to move his car to another location. He calmly moved his car. Uh, Mr. Brooks was asked whether or not he had a weapon. Uh, he indicated that he did not. Uh, without any resistance, he passed his driver's license to the officers. And the officers then asked Mr. Brooks whether or not he would consent to a pat down or a, a body search. And uh, Mr. Brooks allowed them to search him and the search yielded no weapon. Uh, we found that it was of interest that um, when the officers patted Mr. Brooks down, uh, they noticed there was a bulge in his pants. They did not pull that item out of his pocket. They took Mr. Brooks's word that that bulge uh, represented a number of dollar bills. Uh, but uh, Mr. Brooks never displayed any aggressive behavior, behavior during the 70, 41 minutes and 17 seconds. Now, this is a, um, another important consideration that we discovered as we evaluated this case. Um, once Mr. Brooks was shot, there is an Atlanta policy that requires that the officers have to provide timely medical attention to Mr. Brooks or to anyone who is injured. But after Mr. Brooks was shot, for some period of two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, there was no medical attention applied to Mr. Brooks. Uh, but when we examined the videotape and in our discussions with what we discovered is during the two minutes and 12 seconds that Officer Rolfe actually kicked Mr. Brooks while he laid on the ground, they're fighting for his life. Secondly, from the videotape, we were able to see that the other officer, Officer Brosnan, actually stood on Mr. Brooks's shoulders while he was there struggling for his life. Um, we were able to conclude that based on the way that these officers conducted themselves, while Mr. Brooks was lying there, that the demeanor of the officers immediately after the shooting did not reflect any fear or danger of Mr. Brooks, but their actions really reflected other kinds of emotions. So as we are drawing our legal conclusion in this case, uh, we were led by the 
two foundational cases in this matter, uh, one being Tennessee versus Garner. And what that case points out is uh, when an officer is pursuing a fleeing suspect that the officer may not use deadly force to prevent escape unless the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses an immediate threat of death or of serious physical injury to that officer. The next foundational case that uh, we used in our analysis is Graham versus Connor, which says that this test is based upon that of a reasonable officer on the scene and not the individual officer, but a reasonable officer on the scene. We've concluded at the time Mr. Brooks was shot that he did not pose an immediate threat of death, serious physical injury to the officer or officers. Um, if you would get the photograph, the, the, yeah, the tape. Uh, this is the first photograph that we were able to clean this kind of crooked to see if you can get a straight one. Uh, what this photograph illustrates is the point that Officer a uh, lock uh, at this point was firing the taser, uh, and this is Mr. Brooks who was firing a taser as well. But I don't know if you can see it clearly. The prongs from the table, the uh, taser, were actually fired above Officer Ross's head. Uh, I'd like for you to also look at the position of Officer Ross and uh, Mr. Brooks that they are here next to this red automobile. If we look at the next photograph, Uh, if we look at the next photograph, we'll see that the positions of both parties uh, have changed. Uh, Mr. Brooks has now moved away from his original position, and we estimate the distance is probably about 12 feet. And uh, Officer Roth has moved about 10 feet from the position in uh, what is our exhibit number one. This second uh, video or second still shows the, um, the very instant that the shot was fired into the back of Mr. Brooks. And uh, we have also calculated the distance and the distance that they are apart at that time was 18 feet 3 inches at the time that this shot was fired. So based upon uh, that information, uh, we have concluded that Mr. Brooks was running away at the time that the shot was fired. Brooks was shot twice in the back. Uh, one of the shots was a center shot to the back uh, that penetrated his heart, and it was done by a 9 millimeter Glock. Now, one of the things that we also uh, relied upon in our conclusion is something that is called under the law or uh, referred to as an excited utterance. And that's when someone makes a, an immediate statement and because it is made without the ability to consult with counsel or to think about it, an excited utterance is considered as highly reliable. And at the time that the shot was fired, 
the utterance made by Officer Roth was, I got him. That was the statement that was made at that time. Um, the, we also noted who is running away. So the city of Atlanta says you cannot even fire a taser at someone who's running away. So you certainly can't fire a gun, a handgun, at someone who is running away. So in addition to our findings, uh, as many of you all already know, that the uh, Atlanta mayor, uh, Mayor Keisha Bottoms, and the police department concluded that Officer Roth's actions were excessive and in violation of a APD's SOP, there's an SOP, I believe it's 4.1.1, and uh, after their analysis that the actions were excessive, Officer Roth was fired. Uh, we have also concluded that Roth was aware that the taser in Brooks's possession, that it was fired twice, and once it's fired twice, uh, it presented no danger to him or to any other persons. Now, um, we have had something quite remarkable to happen in this case, and it involves the testimony of the other officer, Devin Brosnan, because Officer Brosnan has now become a state's witness. He has decided to testify on behalf of the state in this case. Uh, what he has said to us that is within a matter of days, he plans to make a statement regarding the culpability of Officer Roth, uh, but he indicated that he is not psychologically willing to give that statement today. Uh, Officer Brosden, however, has admitted that he was in fact standing on Mr. Brooks's body immediately after the shooting. So these are the charges that uh, we have had filed a day, signed by one of our Superior Court judges. Uh, these are the 11 charges against Officer Roth. Uh, the first charge is felony murder. This is a uh, the death that is as a result of a underlying felony and in this case, the underlying felony is aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And the possible sentences for a felony murder conviction would be life, life without parole, or the death penalty. Now, uh, he's also charged uh, by, uh, in, in the arrest warrant, with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a count charging him for the shooting of uh, Mr. Brooks and the possible sentence for aggravated assault is one to 20 years. The uh, second or uh, the third aggravated assault account is for the shooting towards or in the direction of Mr. Melvin Evans. Mr. Evans was the person who was seated in the car. Let me have a picture of Mr. And uh, if you would point out, this automobile is the place that Mr. Uh, Evans and his two companions were driving, and a shot was fired. And I believe we also got a photo of the shot that ended up in the vehicle. I think you got to stand up. And so with count um, four uh, against uh, Miss Officer Roth, it charges him with aggravated assault for fi firing the weapon uh, in or in the direction of Danielle Killians, uh, who was in the passenger side of the front seat of the car. Uh, next slide. Uh, count five uh, is an aggravated assault charge 
and this was a charge for shooting towards or in the direction of Michael Perkins. Mr. Perkins was seated in the rear of this same vehicle uh, at that time. There's a charge for criminal damage for shooting into that vehicle. Also, uh, Officer Roth is charged with seven violations of office. Each one of those carries a one to five sentence. Uh, these are violations of his oath of office for the city of Atlanta, arresting Mr. Brooks for the DUI without immediately informing him of the arrest, uh, shooting a taser at Mr. Brooks while he was running away, which again is a, um, a violation of Atlanta's own SOP. Uh, thirdly, excessive force when shooting a firearm at Mr. Brooks. And number four is the failure to render timely medical aid. Those are the four violations of oath. The eighth is for kicking Mr. Brooks, and the possible sentence for kicking Mr. Brooks is from one to 20 years. And we actually have a photograph of the And these are the charges for um, Officer Brosnan, and there are a total of three charges. And the first charge is for aggravated assault, and this is for standing or stepping on Mr. Brooks's shoulder. Um, and uh, the possible sentence for this crime is one to 20 years, and this is a photograph of Officer Brosnan, who you can see to the right. And at the time of the photograph, he is standing on the body of Mr. Brooks. And as I've indicated earlier in our conversations with Mr. Uh, with uh, Officer Brosnan, he has admitted that he stood on the body of Mr. Brooks. He said he believes that he was standing on Mr. Brooks's arm, uh, but that is what the photograph shows. Uh, we've also uh, charged him with uh, additionally two uh, violations of oath. Uh, one is for the standing on the shoulder. That is an unauthorized weaponless control technique which the city of Atlanta uh, prohibits and the second violation of oath was for the failure to render timely medical aid uh, to, um, to uh, Mr. Brooks. So uh, the arrest warrants have already been signed. Uh, we are asking Officer Roth and Officer Bresnan to surrender themselves by 6 p.m. on tomorrow. Uh, we are because uh, Officer Brosnan is now becoming a cooperating witness uh, for the state. Uh, we are asking the court to uh, grant a bond of $50,000 and to allow Mr. Uh, Officer Brosnan to sign that bond. Uh, as I indicated, that uh, he would become one of the first police officers to actually indicate that he is willing to testify against someone in his own department. Uh, as for Officer Roth, uh, the person who fired the two bullets, uh, we are asking, we are recommending no bond for Officer Roth. If he is um, given a bond, uh, that would be done by one of our Superior Court judges. But because of the uh, severity of his act and then following up that act with kicking Mr. Brooks, uh, we're asking that he not be granted a bond. 
Uh, I think that's it. I, I do want to um, ask Mr. Sean Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams represents uh, Melvin Evans, who was driving the vehicle from Memphis. Uh, I have already apologized to Mr. Evans on behalf of the people of Fulton County and the city of Atlanta. Uh, he was only down here for a short while, and it's really unfortunate that he was, uh, his vehicle was fired upon that night. Sean. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I first want to, on behalf of all three of my clients who not only witnessed this horrific and tragic killing of this young man, I want to offer the condolences from them um, to the Rayshard Brooks family, and particularly his daughter. Um, it has been very difficult for each one of my clients because they witnessed it, and they themselves have a lot of emotion on what they saw and what they was a part of involuntarily. I want to thank Paul Howard personally and commend him. I've been doing these type of cases across this nation, and Mr. Howard is one of the few prosecutors who will actually go on the line to even investigate something like this, as serious as this, and to do it in a way that I believe makes this city proud, as I'm a resident of this great city. And as he said, um, with greatness come responsibility. The city of Atlanta is a great city. And I wanted to apologize to my clients themselves that they came to, from Memphis and witnessed this. Um, they're not going to give statements here today, but I will confirm to you that they have met with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, provided them statements as well as information to support what you saw presented today by Paul Howard. It confirms that at no time was Mr. Brooks ever a threat to anyone, including the officers in that Wendy's parking lot. My client's statements confirm that Mr. Brooks was running, his back was turned, and was never a threat to anybody. The only threat that arose is when officer pulled out a gun. Two of those bullets entered Mr. Rayshard's Brooks' body killing him. One of those bullets entered my client's vehicle, almost killing them. Um, we could be here talking about four murders. And for that, um, my clients have suffered a lot, but nothing compared to what this family has. And with that said, my clients are here to join the fight of justice, to provide any assistance to this family, as well as to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, as well as the GBI. And they look forward to an opportunity where they have justice is served. And I want you to know that they were fearful for their lives. Um, that bullet came very close to them, and Mr. Brooks's body laid less than 10 feet from their vehicle. And keep in mind, this was in a crowded Wendy's drive through parking lot. And when you take the actions of reasonableness, as Mr. Howard said, reasonableness never has a deadly weapon being fired when you have innocent bystanders like my client standing. All of those things, as well as the fact that Mr. Brooks was not a threat to any officer that night, should have gone into play, but it didn't. And I hope and pray that with this action by Fulton County District Attorney's Office, as well as the actions by Mayor Bottoms and the task force, that we don't have to have any more press conferences like this anytime soon. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I appreciate you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Miller, who is the wife of uh, Rayshard Brooks, is here today. Uh, I think her attorney, Chris Stewart, is going to speak in her stead. Uh, good evening, I'm Chris Stewart. Um, I'm my law partner, Justin Miller. Uh, Tamika is not in a position to speak right now. Uh, she wasn't aware of all of this information, just like we weren't aware, just like I don't believe the nation was aware of all of this, um, that the shot happened after the deployment of the taser where he started running again. Um, 
that you would kick another human being after you just put two bullets in his back. Um, but even in dark times like this, you have to try and see the light. And the positivity of this situation is the courageousness of Officer Brosnan to uh, step forward and say what happened was wrong. It is officers like that who change policing. Um, and I know he'll probably catch all kind of problems and hate and things like that, but it's the courageousness of those type of officers that we love and support. Um, it's the courageousness of district attorneys that are gonna do their job. Um, and we were willing to accept whatever the findings were. Um, but that's why people elect you, do your job. Um, that's why you become a police officer, do what's right. Um, so it's not a day of joy watching the charges and uh, what's going to happen to this officer because it shouldn't happen. Um, so it's heartbreaking, but it is an attempt to redefine justice because like I said before, we don't have any idea what it is anymore in this world. Um, and if it's, this is what justice is going to start looking like, officers stepping forward to stop other officers coming forward and helping try and get a family who now has their father gone uh, justice that we support it um, and thank everybody out there who is supporting this family and trying to change the world of uh, policing for the better for everybody